15 years ago, the poaching of Patagonian and Antarctic toothfish, an apex predator in the Antarctic ecosystem, was so extensive that one out of three fish was being caught illegally. A fleet of six ships was able to avoid justice because they were changing their names and they were changing their flags constantly. These vessels would, as an Australian customs plane, would fly overhead of them and document what they're doing. As soon as that plane is over the horizon, the ship would already be poaching under a different name. They would flag to countries like Sierra Leone, to Nigeria, even to North Korea to avoid justice. And so you can imagine if the Australian government documents one of these ships poaching fish down in the Antarctic and they complain to Pyongyang about illegal fishing, that's not going to go particularly far. So the idea with this campaign was quite simple. We were going to shut down these six remaining poachers. And to do so, we were going to bring one of our ships, the vessel I was in command of, the Bob Barker. We were going to find one of these vessels in the most remote oceans in the world, in the Southern Ocean. And we were going to be a spotlight, lighting up their criminal enterprise to the world. We were going to be a loud hailer, exclaiming to the world, this is where this poacher is, right here, right now, arrest this ship. And we were going to make a citizen's arrest, and we were going to hope that some law enforcement agency somewhere was going to take over this arrest from us. It took about two weeks to sail from Australia down to the shadowlands of the Southern Ocean. And out of the mist and out of the fog appeared the most notorious poaching vessel in the world. This was a vessel flagged to Nigeria called the Thunder, a vessel wanted by Interpol, estimated to have made a profit of over $60 million in their 10-year poaching career. I radioed this ship, I told them that they were under a citizen's arrest, and they ignored me. And thus began what would later become the longest maritime pursuit in history. The first thing that the Thunder did was they tried to lose us in the heavy ice fields of Antarctica. But by following in the warm line that their wake drew through the ice, we were able to keep up with them. The Thunder then tried to go for the massive storm systems that build up around the Southern Ocean. As we chased the Thunder north, six, seven, eight meter waves beat and battered the Bob Barker, my vessel, as we continued to give chase. And then off the waters of Madagascar, the Thunder tried a new tactic. They tried to wait us out. They tried to test our patience. And that was undoubtedly the most difficult part of the campaign because we had no idea where the end was in sight for us. I remember one day in particular, my chief engineer would come up every day with our fuel figures for the day. I realized that we had 370,000 liters of fuel remaining on board. Our engine was shut down, so we were only consuming the fuel that our generator was burning. And so after making some quick calculations, I determined that if the thunder drifted indefinitely, then we could be out at sea for up to two years. So I went down and I grabbed my chief cook from Australia, Priya was her name, and I asked her, Priya, do we have enough food to stay out at sea for two years? To which she replied, we have enough food to survive at sea for two years. And out of a crew of 30 people, all 30 people decided that this was a chase worth seeing to the end, even if it lasted two years. But after 50 days, the Thunder decided to try to resume their illegal fishing activity. I watched as their stern door opened up. I watched as a fishing net came out aft. I brought the Bob Barker in behind them. My crew cut that net from that ship, and that was the last time that the Thunder ever tried to fish. We were grateful on board the Bob Barker because finally the ship was moving again. And so we chased the Thunder around the Cape of Good Hope, past South Africa, Namibia, Angola, Congo, and finally about 80 nautical miles off the small island state of Sao Tome and Principe. I was called up to the bridge 110 days into the chase because the Thunder crew was abandoning ship. I stood on the bridge of my ship and watched 40 crew get into life rafts. The weather was perfectly calm, but this vessel was sinking. After 110 days of pursuit across 10,000 miles and across three oceans, the captain of the Thunder realized that because he could not sink pursuit, he was going to try to destroy the evidence of his crime that was on board. 
But before this ship sank, once it had been abandoned, three of my crew boarded. They took mobile phones, computer hard drives, nautical charts, anything that they could gather as evidence we would turn over to Interpol. And as they wandered through the ship, they noticed that every single door and every single hatch had been tied open or locked open so that water could move from one area of the ship to the other, ensuring that the ship would go down. We saved all 40 crew. We turned them over to the South Tomei Coast Guard. The captain and two of his officers were arrested. They were sentenced to three years imprisonment and they were fined 15 million euro. What was incredible about this chase was that because we were setting the political agenda, because we were bringing attention to the issue of poaching in the Southern Ocean, governments had to react. And in the wake of this incident, the other five vessels that were poaching toothfish down in the Antarctic were arrested in Cabo Verde, in Senegal, in Indonesia, and in Malaysia. And in just two years, we were able to shut down illegal fishing down in the Southern Ocean. Oh, 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 oh,